Dan, how do you define behavior-driven development? BDD is interested in the kinds of interactions between the people who do the work to deliver software. So what I mean by that is you've got stakeholders, domain experts, people who care about you doing work for them, or to, uh, it's a lovely phrase um, that I like, which is the people whose lives you touch with your software. <laughs> so a guy called Mark McNeil I work with. He says, think about the people whose lives you touch with your software. Those guys, right, they're the stakeholders. They're the people who actually matter. Um, and we want to talk to those people. We want to engage those people. We want to have constructive, useful conversations with those people. So behavior-driven development is... its Each of those words matters. It's... it's Behaviour is the what I expect, what I want a system to do to help me solve problems. That drives the development process. Okay, so then, how does it relate to DDD? Domain-driven design. All of those words matter. So, the idea is that it's a process of design. The way in which you do your design is your understanding of a domain drives how you design software. Your, the words you use, the way you put those words together, what those words mean, the various different subdomains or the various different contexts within which you might use language matter. And lots of stuff comes out of deeper understanding of the domain. As a developer understanding a domain, I might suggest that, well, actually, now we've got these concepts modelled, we can have them interact in this way, which gives you some new benefit, stakeholder domain expert. And domain expert says, oh, actually, that's pretty interesting for me. So you get a two-way flow. It's not just information coming in. Um, BDD, the second D, or the rather last D, whatever, in BDD is development. It's behavior-driven development. It's a process of writing software, of delivering a a computer-based solution that solves the problem for you. So I see them as massively complementary. So behavior-driven development says, Once we understand our domain, once we know the kind of problems we're trying to solve, what would a system look like that was able to solve those problems? How would it behave? Now, trying to put domain-driven design and behavior-driven development in any kind of linear relationship or or subservient relationship is as unhelpful as saying we're going to do all of our design and analysis and then we're going to write some code. The two processes necessarily inform each other. I have to, I have to start with some understanding of my domain. That allows me to start having useful conversations around problems I might want to solve in that domain. I can't talk about the behaviour of a system unless I've already established a shared vocabulary to talk about the problem we're trying to even solve. Sometimes I write tests to discover the language I need to express a story, and in this case I call them scenarios. Then I even spell spell out TDD as test-driven design. Curiously, when I was reading about behavior-driven development, I noticed that you use the word scenario as well. Do we use it in the same way? For me, there are two levels um, of behavior-driven development. One of them deals with scenarios. Um, and we use the word scenarios. A scenario is an example of the entire system in action from the point of view of somebody who's using so it. That's user level, it's stakeholder level, it's in that, it's in that vocabulary. Yeah. So um, the, the system, through some feature, delivers a benefit to somebody. Um, and you can only tell that, you can only get that benefit through some interface, by which I mean not a class interface, but a, a user interface. Oh. And a, a user interface might be graphical, it might be if you're, if you're support, um, I've been on support, and my interface to the system was the log files. Mm. So I'm actually a stakeholder who's also a developer. Um, but that's my interaction with the system, is the log files. After the user interface, after you've got the code out that makes that screen or those log files, the, the, the mechanism for interaction, there's some code behind that that delivers some benefit, some, something of value to the user interface. Um, and that has some little features, some smaller features. It has some behaviour behind those features. And behind that is another piece of code that gives something of benefit to that bit of code. And it turtles all the way down. Right, it's tur- exactly. It turtles all the way down. So a scenario is really useful because it gives you... The word scenario 
um, an example. You can talk about, give me an example of that, give me a scenario. You, trying to turn around somebody who, who is a user of the system, perhaps a non-technical person, and say, give me a use case. They'll be like, what? But you say, give me an example. What do you mean? OK, well, given that you've already done this stuff, when you press this button, what happens? What do you want the outcome to be? Oh, well, um, if I've done this, I want this to happen. If I've done this, I want this to happen. Oh, so we now... Uh, actually, that's two examples. It's two different scenarios. So let's take the first of those. And there's, there's a language there which you can use to discuss the behaviour of your system. When you get down into um, the lower levels of code, you can start talking about the behaviour of that code. And there's only one audience to discuss the behaviour of that code. We're all technical, we're all developers. So we don't need to worry so much about the, the benefit in the feature. We, we know what it is we want out of that code, but we still have the contexts and the events and the outcomes. We just use a shorthand form for it. So we'll put it all in one method and we'll also, go, yeah. the game should do something or other. When you say there's one audience for that code, um, at the sort of lower code level, if you like, I still want to be using the ubiquitous language of my domain. Absolutely. Because then my developers are going to be having useful conversations with my domain experts. Right. And we've seen this lovely emergent behaviour where if you get the words right all the way in, so in other words, if account means account, and if this is on a... Uh, my, my, my sort of recent experience this was on an investment banking trading system. And trading credit derivatives is, I mean, if you want a domain language, <laughs> if you want a, a, a domain with its own jargon and its own very specific definitions, credit derivative trading is, is certainly one of them. Um, and so we had, I had a pair of developers, and they were struggling with some really complex or complicated to them piece of functionality of how you price, I'll, I'll just throw in some words, and it doesn't matter if they don't make any sense, the point is that they don't make any sense unless you really know the domain. They were trying to perturb an interest rate curve and discover, uh, calculate the present value of a collateral debt obligation, a CDO. Do you see what I mean? It's this incredibly jargony language. And they couldn't work out, they were struggling with how to work out the algorithm for doing this thing. And they're having this conversation, and one of the guys, one of the business analysts walked past, he was like a former trader, and they're, they're, they're saying, well, should this go here? or should that? And he thought they were discussing <laughs> how you price credit derivatives. And he said, no, it doesn't work like that. And he leant in, he grabbed a piece of paper, and he said, this is what you do. And they said, oh, fantastic. He's just given them the algorithm. Because they were all, literally, the language was ubiquitous. He didn't know they were talking about classes and objects in their system, and the answer he gave them was directly relevant to what they were doing because all the words he used had direct analogues in the code. Yeah, now, that is enormous value. What we, ca what we try and capture with these scenarios is, uh, as some stakeholder, as someone who's interacting with the system, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve by interacting with the system in your own language? And how might the system best support you achieving that? So, so, so having a strong domain language and having a strong shared understanding of this ubiquitous language is a necessary precondition for that being a useful conversation. But there's a second step, which is now if we structure that conversation... Uh, I mean, your, your, I think it was your phrase or someone's phrase recently that I heard over the last couple of days, which I loved, which was domain-driven design gives you the words... Vocabulary. The vocabulary and behaviour-driven development... Gives you a la is the sentences you build with that. Yeah, it was you. So was Vladimir, grammar. there we go. Vladimir, Vladimir yeah. <laughs> takes yeah. full credit for that. So domain driven design is the words. It's getting the words right. It's, it's, it's that we both mean the same thing by credit derivative. We both mean the same thing by customer, by sales tax, by whatever it, whatever our domain might be. Perturb. Should be. Perturb. Perturbing <laughs> an interest rate curve. What? <laughs> Um, yeah. If we both mean the same thing by that, we can now start to have intelligent conversations around how software might help you. And the way in which we get software to help you is the behavior-driven development. Eric always emphasizes the power of concrete example. Take a story, break it down into concrete scenarios with numbers, and talk through these scenarios to understand the story. You've written a tool called JBehave, which formalizes this approach in the language of givens, 
actions and outcomes. Could you talk about your ideas behind JBehave? For me, the power of behavior-driven development is the kind of seamless mapping, if you like, between you telling me what you want the system to do and me being able to demonstrate that the system I've got here does it. And the way I do that is I want to, or rather the, 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 um, the, the holy grail, if you like, of that is being able to take your statement of a requirement and just make it executable. And the mapping phase we have with integration tests or functional tests or FIT or those kind of, you know, Selenium, these kind of automated testing frameworks is that I need to map what you told me about what you want the system to do to something where I can say, look, it does all these things. Is that what you meant? So where I want to get to is a seamless integration between your statement and the code. Yeah. So what JBehave gives you and what the BDD, the kind of automated BDD frameworks give you, so there's RSpec is the Ruby one, there's one in .NET called nBehave, is I can give you a fairly loose grammar. Mm -hmm. And the grammar is you start each line of your description with the word given, if it's something to do with setting up the example, when, if it's the actual execution of what's interesting, and then, if it's verifying what should have happened. Right. So we could say, given, say I want to withdraw cash from an ATM. Uh, given the accounts in credit, uh, and the, uh, the card itself is valid, and the ATM's working, and all those kind of things. When I request $20, then I get $20, the card is returned, the account's debited $20, so what we're doing immediately by having this conversation is I'm aware which bits of those you think are just setting up an interesting world, which bits are the actual value, if you like, withdraw, request some cash, yeah. Yeah, the interactions with the system, and which bits are how we know whether it worked. Then what I do is for each of those little lines, for each line, for each of those givens, each event, each outcome, I can turn that into a little chunk of automated code. And now all I'm doing when you describe this scenario is I'm just chaining these bits of code together. And it really is that unintelligent. It's just a bunch of little steps that we chain together in a sequence. And what's, what, what's interesting is around a particular story, around a particular feature, the different scenarios will usually involve the same event, the same interaction with the system, which is the feature you asked for. And what the scenarios are are the different ways in which it might work or not work. So yeah. what we're now doing is, is just plugging together different combinations of givens, events, and outcomes. And if these things are automatable, then literally you as the tester can go, what happens if I get that bunch of givens and I want that bunch of outcomes? Does it do that? So you designed a language around stories and scenarios with a triangle of given, when, and then, where stakeholders, domain experts, testers, and developers are responsible for some of its vertices. How do you see the responsibilities and interactions? I thought for a long time BDD was about this story. We had this domain model for a feature for how work gets done. And yeah, that's be it's not. BDD is actually about the sequence of interactions between the various people on my team and the stakeholders. And these all these, as you say, I've got my stakeholders, my users, my testers, my developers, my analysts, all these different people involved in getting work done. The stories and the scenarios and the code itself is a kind of it's a byproduct of them having good conversations, good interactions. So at the very outset, what we're going to have is a stakeholder saying, "I'd love you to do some work for me." Excuse me, and that gives me the, the story title. The story title is "Login," yeah, or "Request Cash," or whatever it might be. That's 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 the the problem I've got at the moment. Is right now I can't withdraw cash. So the feature I'd like is the ability to withdraw cash so that I don't have to queue up at the desk. Yeah. So now I've got... So, so, and that's a conversation typically between my stakeholder and my business analyst. Because the business analyst is, isn't the guy who says, this is what you click on, this is how it works. Right? Or the guy who puts together the domain glossary thing. Yeah. The business analyst is the person who's an expert at helping the stakeholder articulate what it is they want. Okay. The analyst necessarily thinks in abstract terms. They think in terms of, I want to withdraw cash, I want to move money around, I want to book a trade, I want to buy something, whatever it is. They then talk to a tester, and the tester's world is much more concrete. The tester's like, well, what does withdraw cash mean? 
if I've got $100 and I withdraw $20, how many dollars do I have in my pocket and how many dollars do I have left? That's the testing world, yeah? Is I want to map this abstract desire that you have to do something to a concrete statement of whether I can do it or not. Mm-hmm. So there's like a second stage now. So the first stage is let's identify who the stakeholder is, what they want and why they want it. That's my story narrative. At that point, we need to understand what done looks like. Yeah, so a lot of the disconnects in terms of software delivery are that the stakeholders and the developers had a different understanding of what done was going to look like. And it's different from you know, incompleteness. So the, so the stakeholder says, but it doesn't do currency conversion. Or, but what do you mean? No, that's not done. Go and do some more work. Or the opposite, which is, how come it's taking you so long? Well, we, we're getting it to do this, and we're getting it to do that, and we can have it in any colour you like. And it's, I didn't want that. I just wanted to solve this really simple problem. Well, you didn't tell us that. You told us you wanted. So you've got these two worlds, yeah. Um, and both of those problems, sort of orders of problems, go away if you start with a shared understanding of done. Yeah. And what BDD does, ironically, is brings the tester right into the middle of the action. So rather than the tester traditionally being a downstream kind of gatekeeper, yeah, here's some software I've written, let me throw it over the wall to you testers, tell us what, tell us what works, what doesn't work. They are the kind of ambassador right at the beginning of the process that says, in terms of interacting between the stakeholders and the developers, this is the work that we'll, we need to do in order to achieve this outcome. And they're also the gatekeeper at the end of the process that says, yes, that's exactly what I meant. Here's my automated tests, my scenarios that run and demonstrate that it works. So the, the, the test has suddenly become this really critical person in your process, which is a bit ironic given that BDD started as an exercise to remove the word test. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out when you, when, when, you take, when, when you allow test to mean what it's supposed to mean, the test has suddenly becomes absolutely critical to everything. Yeah, when you allow behaviour to mean what we've been using test to mean, you suddenly notice how important the tester actually is. Let's go back to what you said about BDD being the exercise to remove the word test. All right, so you removed test and replaced it with should. What difference did it make? So it's, it's, not, it's not just that it's the word should. It's the sentence template, right. some object should do something. And it's a really, really, it, it seems like it shouldn't constrain you to anything, but it causes you to make statements about what a particular object should do. And there's two lovely bits of stuff that fall out of that. One lovely bit of stuff is if you can't make a sentence that this thing should do something, then that responsibility probably doesn't belong with this object. It's probably somewhere else. But there's another lovely thing that happens, which is all these things, as soon as you've written the code that's going to make these things run, they become tests. And that's the big kind of um, the smoke and mirrors part of TDD, if you like is the code that you start by writing as an example to guide your design to write your application. As soon as you've got your application, it becomes a test and spends the rest of its life being an automated test. So it's so really easy to confuse it with being a test when you first wrote it. It's not just a test, though. It's also documentation. So if I want to know how my game behaves, I'm finding this increasingly on my current project where all of our tests, start, test, should do something or other people are increasingly, when they come to look at a class for the first time, not going to the class itself, but to the descriptions of its behaviour, to the tests, and going, what should this thing do? Does it do what I want it to, or do I need to add something more? And the word should, we had the big argument right down at very, very early days of BDD about whether it should be will do something or other. We've got this whole RFC, <laughs> of, uh, RFC vocabulary about will, must, should and shall and all that, you know. <laughs> So, uh, and, and we had, um, yeah, I, I prefer must. You know, should is all a bit fluffy, right? It must do this, and if it ever doesn't do this. I like should um, at a humanistic level. I like people to read the word, this should behave in this way, because it allows them to think, should it? It allows them to question that premise, yeah? If it's must, I see must, and I'm like, oh, that's a rule. Someone put that there for a reason, <laughs> I, I'm not allowed, I feel at some sort of basic level, I'm not allowed to challenge must. But if I see this thing, you know, should report true when empty, should it? Oh, no, that's because, yeah, that's because when we used to have empty lists, we used to, no, it shouldn't, that's rubbish. Yeah? I'm allowed to have an opinion about it, because it's only should. I've actually had conversations with developers where I've gone, 
they've said, you know, well, it doesn't do that anymore, so how do we change the test? I said, well, OK, what does the test say? It says test should do that. Well, should it do that? Well, no, not anymore. Well, delete it then. <laughs> and if, now, if that was a sentence in a spec, uh, that it should do something, something, and it's a, must it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Yeah, it must do something, and it was a Word do. document. And we're sitting there reviewing this Word document, and we both said, yeah, it shouldn't. That, that, that's not true, is it? No. You delete the line. You don't, you, don't, you don't fear that you've just made the document less useful by deleting the line. You do if it says, must do this. Well, you You're do like, if it says must text. must it do that? Right. If I remove, if I reduce, if I delete a test from my code base, I've reduced the quality of my code. I now have fewer tests testing my code. See how the whole vocabulary of testing makes me think differently. If I've got, a, if I've got two conflicting sentences about you know, describing some behaviour, this one says it should do this. This one says it should do that, and I know that one's true. I delete that one. In BDD, the stuff we're writing, these examples, these scenarios, they're documentation. They happen to be documentation written in such a way that I can press a button and they run. So they're self-verifying documentation. But in the same way as any other kind of documentation, they represent my understanding of a system. On which, different levels. On different levels. And they represent my understanding of, of, of a system in the language of a domain. So in the same way that I would evolve my documentation as my domain understanding evolves, it's perfectly appropriate to evolve my behaviours, evolve my examples, evolve the kind of stuff I've got at that level um, as my understanding of the domain evolves. All right, so in the beginning of our conversation, you said that BDD and DDD are massively complementary. How do they complement each other? How does it work? If you imagine this kind of bubble that is my application, now there's a bunch of ways that I might go and fill that bubble that is my application. We've got the kind of the various schools of top down, which is I assume it's one big bubble and I break it into smaller bubbles and bubbles down to bits of code I can write. I do bottom up, which is I probably start with a bunch of frameworks and a bunch of architects and I end up with some stuff that hopefully solves the problem. Then we've got outside in, which is where BDD sits, which is I use the language of the domain and conversations with the various stakeholders to understand the outermost objects, the outermost domain concepts that are going to make sense to you, whether it be you know, a ship and a route and a whatever else, or whether it's an account and a balance transfer, those things. And then I'm going to work inwards from those. Now, what... BDD gives you is the domain language for specifying the outside of that onion. So it says, here are the scenarios, here's the, you know, the givens, the way I set up uh, the world that's going to exercise this application. Here's the event, here's the interaction with the application. Here's the outcomes, here's the way I verify that the application did what it's supposed to do. One step in, one layer in from that, if you like, is that, so, so you've got the the outside world looking in at the application is BDD. The inside world looking out is the domain. It's domain-driven. Yeah? All of these concepts on the, outer, on the outermost inner edge, <laughs> trying to describe something without a picture. On, so the inside of the shell of the onion is all domain terms. It's all domain expert type domain terms. It's all ubiquitous language terms. The way in which I constrain my application, what it does, what it doesn't do, what I care about, what I don't care about, is in a specific separate domain language, which is scenarios, stories, stakeholders, features, outcomes, givens, all of that stuff. Behaviour. Behaviour. And BDD has its own little domain language that says, here's how I constrain the onion. Here's how I know what done looks like. Here's how I don't go and write a bunch of other things I don't care about. Or here's how I avoid not doing stuff that I should have cared about. <laughs> yeah. So there's at least, I'm starting to realise now, there's at least three different domains at play here. There's the domain as in DDD. There's the domain as in the domain experts wanting to move ships around the world. There's the domain of software development itself, which is I have stories and scenarios and stakeholders and some other things beginning with S, right? And... There's the domain of interacting with a software application. So there's a browser or a UI or whatever it is. And what I want to do is have useful conversations about how those three domains get work done. 
how can I define a software system, how can I describe a software system that will usefully help me plan better shipping routes through a web-based interface than another system I could write. I just moved right. through three domains in that sentence. I moved through domains of web, software development, and shipping. What BDD does in, const, in, in, in conjunction with DDD is allows me to have useful conversations fluidly through those three domains. What we have when we're trying to understand a domain and write software to help people get work done is a system moving between those various domains. And each iteration, if you like, each pass through each of those domains gives me more information, gives me more texture, gives me more detail about those domains. So understanding the kinds of problems I could solve with software allows me to think about the problems that it's possible to solve with software that allows me to think about competitive advantage in my domain. That, and the competitive advantage might come from developers because they now have a deeper understanding of the domain because they're talking to domain experts. But domain experts are getting more of the art of the possible by seeing software coming out of a process which is behaviour driven. So they say, well, I didn't even realise that was possible. Given we can do that, could we do this mad thing? And the mad thing, it turns out, is really easy if you're a developer, because that's just that thing with a bit of that thrown in. Only domain-driven design can tell me where, on, where, where I should or shouldn't be focusing my efforts. That's the kind of outermost shell, if you like. That's the world I operate in. Once I've determined that some kind of computer system might help me, I need a way of getting, you know, to, to use the Mary Poffendick term, from concept to cash. I need to get from an idea of some outcome I want to a production software system making me money or saving me money or doing whatever it's doing. The way in which I get to that is behaviour-driven development. It's the series of conversations, interactions, ways in which I express my domain desires as functioning software. But that is a necessarily iterative, a necessarily learning process.